This week on the Gadget Show Web TV, John's testing out the Panasonic Lumix G1. And Dion showing you how to build your own website. Plus the latest in gadget tech news. And welcome to the Gadget Show Web TV. Later on in the show, I'll be showing you how to build your very own website. But first, I've been trying out an exciting new camera from Panasonic, the Lumix G1. This is Panasonic's new Lumix G1. It looks like a digital SLR, but it isn't. Panasonic are claiming it's the world's first digital camera with interchangeable lenses and a full-time live view of what you're about to shoot. They claim it's got the advantages of a digital SLR in terms of versatility and image quality and the advantages of a digital compact camera in terms of ease of use. Now, with a digital SLR, normally when you open up the lens, you actually see a mirror which takes the image of what you're about to shoot up optically through to the viewfinder at the back. Well, here it's all done electronically. The image is immediately picked up and sent either through to the LCD screen, which uh, twists and turns very handily, or up to the optical viewfinder here. And it can tell whether you've uh, actually got your eye up to the lens because of the sensor there, which uh, switches between the two very handily. Now, normally, electronic viewfinders in stills cameras are very bad news. They're very crude affairs, which you only want to use, say, when it's very bright outside and you really need to shield your eyes from the glare. But Panasonic have really gone to town with this one. They've given it 1.4 million dots of resolution. Now, a dot isn't quite a pixel, but it still gives a very smooth, large image. And it refreshes 60 times a second. So you don't get that delay between what you're looking at in an electronic viewfinder and the reality outside. Now, there are other advantages of electronic viewfinders as well. Uh, you can easily change the format of what you're shooting. This one allows you to choose between 16 by 9, 4 by 3, or 3 by 2. I'd like to even go even further further and actually have a sort of square image size as well. The G1 is smaller than all current digital SLRs and lighter than virtually all of them, but SLR users will feel at home because of the layout of the controls. For example, there's the uh, dial there, which allows you to switch between uh, manual mode, shutter priority, aperture priority and program mode, plus a lot of different scene functions. And there's a switch here for uh, switching between uh, continuous and single autofocus and manual focus. At the same time, users of uh, Panasonic's compact cameras certainly will feel at home as well, particularly with the quick menu button, which uh, brings up a lot of easily adjustable quick functions on the screen. Lenses available at launch both have uh, optical image stabilization and include this uh, 14 to 45 kit lens that's uh, equivalent to 28 to 90 millimeter in 35 millimeter terms. It's really chunky and satisfying to hold. You just want to get out there and take pictures, which is great. And I do appreciate having the separate twisty screen and the viewfinder. It's very valuable. I also like the quick autofocus. It's surprisingly quick, in fact, although I was disappointed by the shutter lag. It's more on a par with a really good compact camera. It's not up to the standards of an entry-level digital SLR. I also don't like this control here. I'm always pressing it when just gripping the camera, and it operates the exposure compensation. I found I was dialing in over or under exposure when I didn't mean to. And also, very surprisingly, the camera doesn't shoot video, which is a very surprising omission in this day and age. What about the all-important image quality, though? Well, I think that is surprisingly good as well. The colours are very strong. The lens is notably sharp, just for an ordinary sort of kit lens. In particular, you get very little of that chrome dramatic aberration, the sort of thing when you're taking a picture against a bright sky where you get some nasty purple fringing, very little of that. Overall though, I think the image quality on uh, our current favourite entry-level digital SLR, the Canon EOS 450D, is a little bit better. And uh, the noise really starts to creep in with this at uh, ISO 1600 whereas uh, on digital SLRs these days it tends to be a bit better. So a couple of issues to address, I think, particularly in terms of the speed of the performance and the final edge in terms of the image quality. But overall, this is an immensely desirable and likeable camera. And I don't think you'd be disappointed if you got one. 
the G1. If you're a lover of your compact camera but you want to get a bit more ambitious with your photographs, this would be the perfect purchase. You can change the lenses and get a bit more perspective in your mm. photograph. Mm, that's right. And also you can uh, start off using, say, the built-in screen, which flips around, is very handy. And then you can move on to using some of the manual controls if you want it. Yeah, it's a really neat little camera. <laughs> right, now it's time for the news. And first up, TVs and computers. It's hard to know these days where computers stop and TVs begin and where TVs stop and computers begin. We're used to seeing computers with TV tuners in. Here's a TV with a computer in it. It's by an American company called Alio, and it's no mean computer, actually. It's got an Intel Core 2 Duo E4800 CPU. It's got four gigabytes of RAM and a terabyte of hard drives. Yes, it comes preloaded with Vista and is available in sizes from 32 inch to 42 inches. It comes with a range of connectivity and you'll find a number of USB ports for your gadgets, wireless and wired networking and an HDMI interface. The screen is capable of 1080p resolutions and it's even got a Blu-ray player built in. Mm, but at the same time they seem to have skimped on the graphics because it doesn't have a dedicated graphics card so you could well be... Uh short change when it comes to playing the latest games on, although it's probably OK for watching telly. And I'm wondering whether you need to boot up Vista first before you play your Blu-ray movies, in which case you could be hanging around for a while before you can watch them. Mm, and also, as it's for the American market at the moment, it probably doesn't, as it stand, have a sort of UK digital terrestrial tuner built in, so they'd obviously need to do that for it to be a credible telly in Britain. Well, we'll have to wait and see. Now, Fujitsu and Hitachi have both announced the release of their 500 gigabyte laptop hard drives. Well, it's good that the capacity of laptop hard drives is actually getting up there towards desktop levels. They always need to play a catch-up game, but I'm always running out of space on my laptop drive, so that's great. Now, Fujitsu are happy that they've managed to claim the world's first on this. They're releasing a 2.5-inch, 9mm thick hard drive, which is about the thickness of my finger. But the world's first doesn't relate to its size, but to the fact that it uses a 256-bit AES encryption, which means that your data will be kept extra safe. So safe, in fact, that if you were to lose your password or forget it, you can kiss your data goodbye. Hmm, Hitachi have similar vital specifications for their uh, hard drive, apart from the fact that they can only manage 128-bit encryption. They also do an ecologically friendly version, though it just consumes 1.4 watts of power. I don't think ecological friendliness for a hard drive is necessarily an issue, but at uh, least it should help keep the battery consumption down, which would be important. Um, most of these are coming up in the next few months, the ecologically friendly version of the Fujitsu early next year. And finally, YouTube are edging closer to streaming full-length movies for free. They've reached agreement with MGM to show some of their classic archive on a new channel called Impact. Films like uh, Legally Blonde, The Magnificent Seven and Ronin. Lionsgate have agreed access to their shorter movie clips, but there's no word yet on when their major titles will be included. At the moment it's US only, but I guess we'll soon see it in the UK if the advertising model works. Yeah, it's a major step forward for watching movie content online for free and legally. It's just a matter of when we're going to see it in the UK. <laughs> Now it's time for one of Dion's how-tos, guides that help you get the most from your tech. Yes, and this week it's all about building your own website. The World Wide Web is crammed full of millions of sites on any topic you could ever imagine. From selling original A-team figures to blogging about Star Wars. It seems the world and his wife are getting their thoughts and ideas out to the world, and so can you. Building your own website doesn't have to be expensive and it's really easy. All you need is an idea of what you're going to put on it, what it's going to look like and what you're going to call it. Here's the Gadget Show's guide to building your own website. Now the first thing you need to think about is content. Making your website about something you're interested in is really important as it will encourage you to keep it updated with things like blogs and pictures. So I've decided to make a tech blog where I can post details on the latest gadgets I get to play with. Next you need somewhere to host your website. I've gone for www.homestead.com which basically enables you to create your website from scratch even if you've never done it before. It's full of templates for everything from page setups and colours to logos making your site fully customisable. All you have to do is follow the on-screen instructions. Choose your page layout and where you want to put your pictures and text. Quite like the look of this template, it's called High Tech. As you can see it's got a nice blue layout and space down the side for my pictures and in the centre for my blog. So I've chosen the template of my website, I just need to add the content now. So I need to click the Edit Your Site tab 
and this will bring up some software called Site Builder, which comes free with homestead.com. It's a basic package that will allow me to add text, pictures, and change the color of my site. There is a more comprehensive version of Site Builder available for free, and will give you more freedom and flexibility for the functions you want to add to your website. But I'm going to use the basic package to start off with. I just need to change the title of the tab, and then I can get busy adding my photos and my blog. Finally, you need to choose the domain name. This is the www address of your site. You just enter your preferred name into this box here and it will search the web and bring back all the different variants that are available. I'm going to go for www.tech-loaf.com. You can now upload your brand new website directly to this domain for the world to see. Well done. And what, what impressed me was I know there's a monthly subscription, but it's not actually that expensive. Whereas last time I did an item on the Gadget Show on how to make your own website, I had to buy some really sort of very expensive programs. Dreamweaver, it cost hundreds of pounds, still does. Whereas here you get everything all in for that fee. Yeah, I mean, it's five pounds a month for the duration of your website and it includes the hosting. I mean, there's millions of packages out there, so there's nothing stopping you from building your own website because it's not that difficult and communicating with the world and sharing your stories. Hmm. Well, that's a lot for this week, but next time... John's looking at the new Plasma TV from Panasonic with built-in Freesat. And John will be showing you how to transfer VHSs onto your PC. See you then.